Well, good morning and welcome to PWC on this fantastic Sunday morning, March 14th, 2021. We are so glad that you are here with us today and that you have decided to join us as we as we worship and as we seek God through his word and as we pray together. And I want to encourage you this morning throughout our time together to not just view this as something to watch, but something to participate and experience in. And so while we sing this morning, I want to encourage you to sing along with us. And while we are praying this morning, I want to encourage you to pray along with us. And while we are seeking God and his word, I want to encourage you to read and and, and worship along with us. And so with that said, wherever you are this morning, if you can stand or if you're more comfortable sitting, let's sing and worship together today.
Well, once again, welcome to PwC. I am so glad that you are here with us today on this beautiful Sunday morning. Uh, before we jump into our message and our series today, Just Jesus, I want to remind you guys of a few things. First, I just want to acknowledge that this has been a crazy few weeks here at PwC. We've had quite a few positive cases of COVID. We made it an entire year kind of without any, and then uh, we had several positives all at once. And I uh, want to encourage you with a couple of things. Number one, we are going to get through this and we're going to get through it together. And we're, we're kind of towards the tail end of it, I think. And and uh, I just want to encourage you to continue to pray for each other, pray for those who are sick. And uh, it seems like most everybody is, is improving or kind of through it. But uh, continue to pray, pray hard for, and we will pray hard together in just a moment. For those who are still sick and uh, just in need of God's touch this morning. Uh, before we jump into it, though, I want to remind you, number one, that this is normally the time where we would receive our tithes and offerings, but obviously we're not in the facility, so uh, it's going to look a little bit different. Here's what I would encourage you to do. Uh, you can do one of several things. Number one, you can mail in your tithes and offerings until we get back to in-person next week. Or uh, number two, you could drop them off at the church uh, in the mailbox or just kind of stick them through the door. Or number three, maybe the easiest way would be to go to our website, prattvillewesleyan.com, click on the give link and make your easy, secure, safe donation that way. But I want to strongly encourage you to continue to support PwC with your tithes and your offerings during this time that we are not meeting in person these last three weeks. Uh, number two, I want to remind you that we are continuing to love and serve our healthcare workers in Prattville at the hospital by giving food and uh, seeing firsthand how great of a job they do and how important this is. So I want to encourage you when you go to the store this week, just pick up an extra box of prepackaged cookies or snacks or chips individually wrapped and drop them off at the church any day of the week. And we will make sure that they get over there to the right people. But we want to continue loving and serving in that way for as long as we possibly can. So I also want to encourage you, just like I mentioned a moment ago, how we're going to get through this together and we're going to uh, kind of love one another through this. I, I want us to pray today and I want us to pray especially for those who are sick and, and pray for our time together. And I want us to pray that God would speak to us and that he would uh, use this church to do incredible things in our community and beyond. So wherever you are, before we jump into the message today, I wanna to encourage you, let's take a few moments here and let's pause and let's pray together. And again, I don't want you just watching me pray on a TV screen, but I want you to pray with us, join our hearts together as we lift those up this morning. Father, first of all, we are thankful for the opportunity to be able to meet together today, even if it is just online. We're thankful that you have provided the technology, the wisdom to be able to do this. We're grateful today, God. And Father, right now, we lift up some people to you who are just hurting, some families who are just in need. And Father, you know the hearts, you know the people that are on all of our hearts, um, those who just need a special, special touch from you. And so God, today I pray that you would just God, that you would bring healing to the physical bodies of those who need healing. God, that you would help those who, who are hurting right now to feel your presence and your comfort with them. God, those who uh, are, are maybe dealing with the tail end of COVID or, or those who are just sick and, and, and need a special touch from you, God, we pray that you would bring physical healing to them. God, I also pray for those who are far from you and that they are spiritually sick. God, that you would, you would reveal your heart to them and that you would show them that they have a Savior that loves them, that died for them, that wants to have a relationship with them. And God, I pray that you would use this church, your church, to be able to make an impact in the lives of people who desperately need it today, God. And God, I pray that you would help us to see how you want to use us. God, that you would show us, that you would reveal it, that you would give us wisdom and that you would guide us in that direction and that we would say yes to how to love our community, serve our community and make disciples of people in our community. God, that's our prayer. 
And Father, we also pray that you would just send us people who are far from you, people who just desperately need a relationship with you. God, send them our way so that we can show them what it means to have a relationship with you. And Father, I pray that in our time together this morning, that you would speak to us through your word over the next few minutes, that you would help us to see what you have done, and God, that you would help us to, to respond with our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we are in a series today called Just Jesus, where we have been talking about Jesus. And, and not just Jesus, but I, I, I'll, the, kind of the idea behind this series is that I picture the disciples sitting around, the, the people that Jesus walked with and talked with in this world when he was actually living as a human being in this world. And I picture, I picture them 20, 30 years after Jesus had left this world and they, they're sitting around eating pizza uh, and, and they're talking to each other and they say, do you remember when Jesus said that thing? Or do you remember when we did this, this crazy thing and Jesus showed us what it really meant? Or do you remember when Jesus did this thing and healed that guy? Yeah, man, wasn't that incredible? Oh, just Jesus could have done that. And so I want us to look at some just Jesus moments. Now, today's is going to be from Mark chapter 9. If you have your Bible, you can go ahead and turn there. Uh, scripture won't be on the screen, so if you want to take a second and, and grab it, uh, feel free to do that. But let me kind of set the stage a little bit for what we're going to be talking about. This is a conversation that is had among Jesus' disciples. Um, they're arguing about greatness. Which of them is the greatest? Which is on the surface level, it's going to look like a very silly argument to be having with Jesus in your midst. It seems pretty obvious who the greatest really is. But when we look a little bit further, I think we're going to see that it's not necessarily as silly of an argument as it looks initially. Uh, let me ask you a question. <clears throat> Other than Jesus, whose greatness do you admire in your life? I mean, Jesus kind of seems like the obvious answer, but, but who else? Maybe you have a favorite athlete and you, you really love watching them play, and you would never admit it, but you have their jersey and you sleep in it every night. Or, or maybe you have a favorite uh, artist, a favorite band, and, and you love their music, and, and you listen to it all the time, and it inspires you to want to be great in your life. Or, or maybe it's just somebody from a, a field uh, that you stud, that you love, your business. Maybe it's your favorite filmmaker, favorite actor, favorite author, whatever it is. Maybe you have a favorite Iron Chef. But who is it that you look at and you say, wow, what they are just so incredible at what they do. What about their greatness intrigues you? And what in your own life are you trying to do to pursue greatness? In what areas of your life are you trying to pursue greatness? Well, the disciples have this question that they're asking among themselves. And Jesus is kind of going to give them what I think is just this incredible answer, this incredible, we'll almost call it a focus on what to do about this word greatness and what it's all about and what it really means. So if you have your Bible, Mark chapter 9, we're going to read verses 33 through 37 together. <coughs> Excuse me, this is what it says. It says, they, they meaning Jesus and the disciples, they came to Capernaum or Capernaum. Now, when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the road, they had argued about who was the greatest. That's exactly right. The greatest. It's their Muhammad Ali moment. Who's the greatest? Sitting down, Jesus called the 12, those are the disciples, and said, anyone who wants to be first or great among you, 
must be the very last and the servant of all. Seems a little bit opposite, doesn't it? Then <laughs> he took a little child whom he placed among them. Now, I want you to picture this moment because I need you to understand that in the ancient world in which we're reading from, women and children did not have the rights that they have today. And children were kind of looked at as be seen and not heard and sometimes don't even be seen. And so Jesus picks up this person who is maybe a little bit less than in society, he picks up this person, puts him on his lap. Could you imagine a stranger coming to your town and doing this? And he picks up the child whom he placed the moment, taking the child in his arms, which is a place of honor. He said to them, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. And in this moment, he gives them this incredible picture of greatness out of what may have been the silliest, craziest conversation of all time. Because you got to look at this from the disciples' perspective. From the disciples' perspective, they're arguing about which one of them is the greatest. Which one among them is the greatest? And the answer would obviously be Jesus. But what they have just seen is that Jesus has just been up on the Mount of Transfiguration, he has just transfigured in glory. Moses and Elijah came to hang out with him in the midst of all of this. Some of the disciples saw this, and then they went and told everybody else, I'm sure. And then he comes down from this incredible experience on this mountaintop, and he cast a demon out of a demon-possessed man. Then he starts quoting the Old Testament, calling himself the Son of Man, the Son of God. And the disciples who are maybe not the sharpest butter knife in the drawer, are like, yeah, but which one of us is the greatest? But which one of us is the best? And Jesus just kind of has this moment where he has to explain to them some things. And, and most scholars would tell you that, that the, the, the disciples' conversation is just a, a straight-up conversation where they don't understand what's going on. But if I'm going to be honest with you today, I think there's more to this story. And I think the disciples aren't just being silly. They're not just being dumb. They're not just being crazy. I think that, and, and, and so I may disagree from the scholars a little bit, which means that I'm probably wrong today. I will go ahead and throw that out there. So this might be the second silliest conversation that has ever happened in the history of the world after this one. But I believe that what's really going on is this. <clears throat> I believe that the disciples, they saw something. I believe that they saw Jesus living his life. I believe that they saw Jesus performing miracles. Like they had never seen anybody who was blind get their sight back. That, that was unheard of. They, they had at this point seen Jesus walk on water. They had seen him cast out demons. They had seen him heal the sick. He had even healed one of their own mother-in-laws. And, and, and so I think that at this point, what the disciples are saying, which one of us is the greatest? What they're seeing is we saw Jesus in all of his greatness. And it inspired us to want to be great. Think maybe like this, like, like you're an athlete or or you were an athlete, or back in school you considered yourself an athlete, and then you saw something on television, and you said, I've got to do that. I'm going to try that. And then you tried it, and then the doctor had to perform surgery on your knee, and once you got all better, you were like, okay, that was worth it. But, but the thing is, is that you looked at someone else's greatness, and it inspired you to want to try something great. Or maybe you consider yourself a little bit of a chef, and... All of a sudden, you're watching the Food Network, and then you go to the kitchen the next day, and you're going to make the best mac and cheese. You're going to try to up your mac and cheese game in a way that you didn't think you could. Why? Because you saw something that was great in someone, and you wanted to achieve greatness yourself because greatness inspires greatness in a lot of ways. And so I think the disciples looked at Jesus, and they say all the great things that he was doing, and they said, we want to be a part of that. We want to have that same level of greatness. And I think that that's what they were seeking after. I think that's what they were going for. 
but Jesus needed to redirect them. And the reason that I think this isn't a silly conversation is because Jesus didn't, he never, he never even rebuked them for it. And listen, he rebuked them about things. He rebuked them a lot. And so the fact that he did not rebuke them in this moment, but instead he instructed them. I believe what he really did was he shifted their focus on what greatness really meant. And I believe that that's what we need God to do for us over the next couple of minutes here. I believe that God, for some of us today, needs to shift our focus around this word greatness and what it means for us to be truly great. Because I believe that God wants us to be great. I believe that Jesus showed us that he wants us to be great, but he wants us to be great a certain specific way. Because listen, there are three ways you can approach this. Number one is you can approach this kind of like the culture does. Look at culture greatness. And really cultural greatness is all about me. It's all about what I think is best for me. It's all about me getting famous. You know, there are people that are great in our society who are great simply because they're famous and they haven't ever really even accomplished anything. You ever heard of the story of a man named Narcissus? Narcissus? Yeah, he, uh, this is this ancient folklore, but apparently he was walking by the river one day and, and he looked at the reflection in the, in the water and he got just obsessed with himself and loved to look at himself and spent the rest of the days of his life looking at himself over and over and over again until he died. That was his life. Now, we get a disorder out of his name called narcissism. But a lot of people pursue greatness this way. It's all about what I can accomplish. Oh, everybody look at me. Everybody look at what I am able to do. And that's not greatness the way that God wants us to perceive greatness. There's a danger, a real danger to your relationship with God if you pursue greatness in the way of, oh, everybody just look at me, just look at me. I want to do something great or be great or be known as great. It doesn't need to be a selfish thing. That's danger number one. Uh, <laughs> there's another danger, though. Danger number two is rejecting greatness altogether, which I've seen a lot of Christians do. They say, oh, I just want to be humble. And, and humility is a great thing. Oh, I don't want greatness. I just, I just want everybody looking at Jesus, which is a great thing. But the reality is, is that we were never called to not give our very best to not do our very best, which a lot of times is an excuse that happens when we say we're going to reject this idea of greatness altogether. And, and, and the reality is, is there's some hypocrisy there, too, because we do want greatness in our lives. We want greatness in our marriage, hopefully. Hopefully you want greatness from your spouse and hopefully you want greatness for your spouse. Right. You want greatness. Think about it like this. If you were picking, uh, you were getting ready to go on a trip and you were um, getting ready to go on your flight, would you want the pilot to have sought after greatness in his field or her field of study? Or would you rather them be mediocre? I'm guessing you're looking for greatness there, right? I'm guessing you probably are. Or how about this? <laughs> <coughs> Let's pretend you needed to have surgery. I think I'm kind of facing this one soon. Would you be looking for a doc? Yeah, just show me the most mediocre doctor, the one that got the mediocre grades. That's what I, I don't want the one that pursued greatness in their field. So, so no, you would want to look for the one that was great at what they did. You would not want someone who was mediocre at what they did. And so I don't think we're supposed to reject greatness. We're supposed to pursue greatness to, to a certain level in our lives, but not about us. So the third thing, the, the way that I believe that we're supposed to approach this subject of greatness, the way that Jesus wants us to, is to do greatness the Jesus way. Do greatness. Be great the Jesus way. What's the Jesus way? Well, I'm so glad you asked because you see, Jesus kind of showed us an example right here in this text that wh whoever wants to be first must be last and servant of all. That's, that's a huge starting place. And then Paul would later come around and he would write about what greatness looked like the Jesus way. Philippians chapter two, if you have your Bible, flip over there. It's just a, a few chapters after Mark. Philippians chapter two Paul would write these words about Jesus and about how his greatness, what his greatness was all about. Philippians chapter 2, 
verses 1 through 11, it reads this. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So the Jesus way, where we humble ourselves and we serve and we love. I want to tell you three things today. Three things that I want to challenge you to do in response to this just Jesus moment. Where the disciples argued about which one of them was the greatest. And Jesus showed them that if you want to be great, it means being a servant. So three things that you can do in your life right now. Get ready to write them down. These are important. I believe that these things, if you put them into practice in your life, can lead to a spiritual maturity in your life that you may be seeking, an intimacy with Christ that you may be seeking. So the first one is this. Live your life for the glory of God alone. Live your life for the glory of God alone. That means... That in everything that you do, you pursue God's glory. I know that seems so simple, but what if every day you decided to just do that? What if every day you just said, I'm going to wake up today knowing that everything I do, I'm going to do to the very best because I'm doing it for God's glory, not my glory. Even Jesus did things for God's glory, his father's glory, not his own. What if, what if I live my life that way? What if you lived your life that way? And we said, I'm going to wake up and set out every morning in my relationships, in my job, uh, with my uh, friends, family. Everything about me is going to exist for the glory of not me. That's the worldly way of looking at greatness. But instead, it's going to exist for God's glory. Man, that would change things for you. Just that simple mindset shift that Jesus gave the disciples here in this moment. I'm going to shift it just a little bit. And I'm going to, instead of existing for my glory and for my ego, I'm going to exist for God's glory. That's number one. Number two, reject unhealthy comparisons to other people. Reject unhealthy comparisons to other people. You know, one of the biggest things that I see Christians doing is comparing themselves unhealthily to other people. This person's better than me. This person's prettier than me. This person's uh, doesn't have as good, uh, has a better job than me. This person makes more money. And, and all of a sudden, listen, that, that only can do one of two things, or it breeds two things. It, number one, breeds to pride, or number two, despair. Pride as in, oh, I'm looking at this person, and you know what? I'm better than them. I've got more money than them. I am better looking than them. I've got a better car than them. And all of a sudden, you begin to feel superior. That's not greatness. And then the second thing it can lead to is despair, which is the exact opposite. I look at somebody and say, wow, I'm not as good as them. I'm not as wise as them. I don't have as good a car as them. And it leads you to despair when God never wanted you to have those kind of unhealthy comparisons to begin with. So I would encourage you to live for God's glory alone. Number two, reject unhealthy comparisons to other people. And number three, this is so simple, but it's so, so important. Number three, use your life to serve others. Use your life to serve others. That means you need to be actively looking for ways 
that you can love and serve other people all the time. Look for ways. Jesus showed us this with the example of picking up the kid. I think he was almost saying, you see the least of these in, in, in the community around us? You need to be looking for ways to serve them. You need to be looking for ways to serve your neighbors, your family members, even the ones that you don't care for as much. You need to be looking for ways to serve people. So what if? What if in pursuing greatness in your life, what if what that meant was that you were going to wake up every day and number one, you were going to commit to live for God's glory alone, not yours, God's glory alone. And number two, you were going to commit to not having unhealthy comparisons in your life. I'm not going to look around at everybody else and think they're better, I'm worse. No, I'm, I'm, I'm past that. And number three, I'm going to exist to simply serve and love people. That's going to be my mission in life. I think that you would have the greatness that Jesus wants for you. Not greatness in the way that this world looks at greatness, but greatness in the way that Jesus wants you to experience it. And I believe it would make a huge difference huge difference in your life and a huge difference in your world. And for some of you today, this is what you need to experience to grow in your relationship with Jesus. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to bow your heads, everybody, wherever you are. I want you to bow your heads and I want you to close your eyes. And I'm going to pray for us as we close out our time together today. I'm going to pray that God would speak to us, not just right now, but he would bring this to our mind in the coming days and that we would commit ourselves to living for his glory and his glory alone, that we would commit ourselves to rejecting unhealthy comparisons and that we would commit ourselves to serving others with our lives. I'm going to pray for us today. Father, thank you so much for your word. God, your word shows us and, and reveals to us how we're supposed to live. And so, Father, I pray that today you would help every single one of us to pursue greatness the Jesus way. That you would help us to seek to live for your glory alone, not our own. That we would reject that. God, that you would help us to avoid unhealthy comparisons to other people that breed jealousy and, and dissension and despair and pride and, and superiority. God, get rid of that within us. And God, help us to use our lives to serve other people. Show us examples of, of our neighbors, our friends, our coworkers, people we go to school with. God, show us how we can better serve. And in doing so, I believe that we will be better followers of you along the way. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you so much again for joining with us today. I hope that this helped you grow in your relationship with God. And just a couple of quick reminders. Number one, uh, uh, I want to encourage you to continue to support PwC with your tithes and offerings. Number two, Continue to help us love and serve our healthcare workers in Prattville and beyond. And number three, uh, during this crazy season that we have found ourselves in uh, with, with COVID, uh, continue to, number one, love and serve each other. Be patient with the process of us getting back in our facility. Hopefully next week, that's our plan, March 21st, for us to be back in our facility in person. Uh, but be patient with the process. We want to make sure it's as safe as it can possibly be for everyone involved. And number three, I want, to I want you to continue to pray for each other. Pray that God would bring healing to those who are sick and, and that God would bring healing and comfort as in a quick way to those who are sick. We're going to get through this together. I'm excited about what God is doing at PwC. This is certainly nowhere near the end of the line. God has big plans for us. He's going to do big things for us, and I am so excited about it. I hope you are too, and I look forward to seeing you guys back next week.